here in front of the pews, we have a small screen that those of us who are seated on the chancel are able to uh, use to watch the service and to view videos like that one. And I have to say that um, the gift of seeing our choir recorded from last September has overcome me a bit. Um, we are grateful uh, for those whose gifts in worship bless us even across time. We are grateful for the promise of God's spirit that unites us even across distance. We are grateful for the gifts of beauty that cannot be extinguished, that cannot be extinguished. Thanks be to God. We continue the story in Acts chapter nine, picking up at the 10th verse. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and, and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. <laughs> but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all those who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. And I myself will show him how much he must suffer because of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim in the synagogues, to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. Beloved, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For 80 years now, Christian Century Magazine has featured a wonderful occasional series with the title, How My Mind Has Changed. The column asks pastors and theologians, writers and thinkers of all types to, to reflect on how their lives and convictions have been transformed by experience. A few years ago, a collection of these essays was published in book form. I, I had it with me the last couple of weeks as our family traveled. And I've enjoyed reading again these essays, reflecting on, on the message that they offer the church and all of us who seek to live faithfully. At one level, if you think about it, their, their very existence suggests not unremarkably that minds can change. Not just any mind, but, but even thoughtful and faithful and brilliant and well-formed minds. Imagine that. That in a time when ideological polarization has deepened distrust and intensified entrenched dogma, it is good to be reminded that to change is often to grow. That to be open to transformation is a sign of life. That resistance to growth can be resistance to God's living spirit. 
In his essay for the series, the poet Scott Cairns describes the transformation in his thinking that has taken place as a result of being part of communities of faith that have challenged his default individualistic outlook. He closes the essay titled Lives, Lives Together with these powerful words. As I continue to discover more fully day by day, this journey toward wholeness is not something that one is able to undertake alone. Fellow travelers aren't simply a welcome luxury. They are crucial to bearing our crosses as we follow God. Fellow travelers aren't a luxury, they are crucial. If there were any doubts as to the truth of these words, the roller coaster ride we've experienced this year should put those doubts to rest forevermore. We have seen together the power of what is possible when, when communities and, and cities and even whole nations pull together to take life-saving action for the good of the other. When diverse groups unite around the values that we proclaim to hold dear, when, when compassion outweighs competition and outranks conquest. And tragically, we have seen the devastating impact of loneliness. We have witnessed the crushing burden of isolation, the destructive power of narrow self-interest, it's been quite a year. Against that backdrop, I've been thinking about this miraculous human capacity to change. I've been thinking about this basic human need for fellow travelers on the transformative journey of faith as, as I've reflected on the story we just heard in two parts from the book of Acts. Without this story, those of us who read and study his letters might think of the Apostle Paul as a, a, a brilliant theologian, as a caring pastor who loved the churches and communities he founded, as a passionate preacher on fire for the gospel, a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, and we would be right about all of those things. But we would be missing so much. For who Paul was is deeply rooted in the journey that led him to this vocation. I think we'd be missing an important part of his message to us. A message we find in this morning's passage of scripture. It all begins with a man named Saul, faithful, devout, zealous, fully committed to the purity of his tradition. The first time we meet Saul, he's watching over the coats of those who stoned Stephen to death for his public profession of faith in Jesus Christ. We learn that Saul is proud to be there, supportive of the execution, in time, we learn more as Saul himself becomes a passionate persecutor of Christians. Acts gives us an unambiguous picture. Here it is. Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off both men and women and committing them to prison. In fact, that's why he's on his way to Damascus on that faithful day. He's seeking followers of the way, early Christians, to bring them back to Jerusalem for trial. His story takes a radical turn on the road to Damascus. Mandy read it so beautifully without warning. A, a, a light from heaven flashes around him. Saul falls to the ground. A voice calls out, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now look, Saul has studied his scripture. 
He knows all about divine intervention. He's read stories, many of which involve blinding lights and booming voices. So Saul asks, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. At that, Saul loses both his eyesight and his appetite. The conversion of Saul is dramatic and total. We teach it to our children to remind them that that God's love can change us, that, that the story of our lives is not limited to the actions of our past. As Brian Stevenson writes in his powerful book, Just Mercy, so beautifully lifted up last week by Madison Van Velen, each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. Can you believe that this is true? So it is with Saul. He had been pursuing and condemning those whom he believed to be God's enemies. And in so doing, he had become an enemy of God's expansive grace. And so it was grace that found him on the road. Grace that picked him up and turned him around. Grace that changed him at the very core of who he was. And so this is a story of how grace can change us. We should not forget it. You see, people of Christian faith are not given the luxury of giving up on anyone. And we tell this story to underscore that truth. I know how tempting it is perhaps especially these days. I know how difficult it is to remember that no one falls beneath the safety net of God's grace. I know how hard it is to proclaim that you and I don't get to draw the lines on God's redeeming love. I will never forget the words of a mentor, professor and minister now in his 90s, I was a college sophomore struggling with with questions of how to know who belongs, how to know where to draw the lines of exclusion, and in classic Socratic form, Dr. Wintermute simply asked, Chris, do you think it is possible to overestimate the love of God? Paul learns the answer. Whenever we presume to draw dividing lines around God's love, we are missing the mark. For change, like redemption, is never beyond reach. Sometimes change involves transforming the way we live, live our lives, Sometimes we, we, we are called to trade hatred for love and, and violence for proclamation of peace. And sometimes, sometimes it means opening our closed-off mind to God's refreshing grace. Ananias, part two a faithful disciple of Jesus, a, a follower of the way, a committed believer God calls and he answers just as the ancient prophets did. Here I am, Lord. God then gives Ananias very clear directions. Now you're going to want to take straight street to Judas's house and look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. Don't worry if you don't recognize him. He'll be looking for you. <laughs> Well, Ananias has heard about Saul of Tarsus. When God tells him that Saul will be looking for him, that confirms Ananias' worst fears. For he has heard of the violent persecutions of Christians and Saul's starring role. 
Ananias must have wondered what in the world God was thinking. This instruction seemed both foolish and dangerous. And so without directly declining, he is speaking to God after all, Ananias makes sure to clarify the command from God. God, you do mean that, Saul? Yes, Ananias, that's all. For God means to transform two souls. And so the Lord responds, Go, for I have chosen Saul as an instrument of proclamation. Trust me. And in that brief encounter, Ananias too is converted. Take another look at your scripture passage, verse 13, Ananias says, Lord, I have heard about this man. Verse 17, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has sent me to you. Ananias makes the journey from skepticism to acceptance, from fear to hospitality, from other to brother. You might say scales fall from two sets of eyes that day. So what are we to learn from the conversion of Saul and the call of Ananias? I think it depends where we find ourselves in the story. All summer we have been reading these wonderful Bible accounts that, that many of us first learned as children. I pray that we have discovered again that storytelling is the most powerful means of sharing our faith. That these ancient chronicles are not so ancient after all. For sometimes we are Saul. Sometimes we need the blinding light. We need the booming voice. We need to be knocked down and turned around. We need a total change of heart. We need a reset. We need transformation. And if that is where you find yourself this morning, Saul's story exists to remind you that you never can fall beyond God's grace, that it is never too late to turn your life around, to commit yourself afresh to what matters most, even today. You can hear that voice, you can see that light, you can be changed. But sometimes we are Ananias. Sometimes we need the firm command to open our hearts to a new possibility. Sometimes we need to be told that the one we have labeled enemy of God can teach us something about God's grace. Sometimes our righteousness becomes self-righteousness. We need an expanded worldview, a widened perspective on God's unconditional love. In both stories, we find the testimony that change is possible. You don't have to forever be who you've been until now. That's the gospel truth. You are not trapped by your past. Your mind is not closed for good. If there is a truth more fundamental to the heart of the gospel, I don't know what it is. But here's one nearly as close. The challenging journey of transformative faith is never one we undertake alone. Saul and Ananias found each other when each needed what the other had to bring. Just so, we require the presence of others. We, we need the gifts they bring, the support they offer, the opportunities they present 
And so the more I read this story, the more convinced I become that conversion is, is not about one moment that, that occurs a single time in a lifetime, that, that conversion is not the 100-meter race before an audience of millions. It's, it's not like having the gold medal placed around our neck there to stay for the rest of our lives. Conversion is a practice a lifelong commitment, a never-ending possibility. Conversion is what happens when God's life and your life become joined on a common journey. Conversion is then the story of our lives. What is your conversion story? Perhaps with boldness you can comment on the Facebook live stream. Maybe it comes in the voice of a friend who, who calls you at precisely the right moment. Sometimes it arrives in the striking beauty of a sunset you almost slept through. Sometimes you find it in the kindness of a stranger Hear it in the power of a song. Watch it in the tears of grief or gladness. My, my, experience of, of, my experiences of conversion are too numerous to name. Each one drawing me a little closer to the reality of God. Or offering assurance in a time of need. Conversion is the story of our lives. For Christians are like churches and trees and sunflowers. We are not alive if we are not growing. My beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, without a doubt, I can tell you that Second Presbyterian Church is alive. For 21 weeks, we have worshipped in this different way. We have adapted and we have stretched in ways we didn't know were possible. We've experienced frustration, exasperation, anxiety, and even some anger. Okay, I'll speak for myself. But I trust we're not unique in those experiences. And yet, through it all, I have seen this venerable, august church find its way in new ways. Do you know that I have Zoomed with a group of men in their 80s? That I've studied scripture with members scattered around the country and enjoyed virtual happy hour trivia games with our full staff. We've changed because we've had to change. And here is my pastoral counsel. Let's not lose sight of what we've learned, what we're still learning about ourselves and our God in the crucible of this daunting year. If we're not changing, we're not growing. If we're not growing, we've stopped living. If we're not open, God will find a way to pry us open. Let conversion be a gift to welcome, an invitation to accept. Twelve years ago today, on August 2nd, 2008, my father-in-law will tell you it was the hottest day of the year in eastern Kansas. Sarah Hayden and I spoke words of commitment to one another. And our dear friend Jay McKell spoke words of affirmation that joined our lives in marriage. In that one moment, through those few words, a transformation took place. One minute we weren't married, the next minute we were, all at once, just like that. Of course, you know that only tells one part of our story. 
For commitment, like conversion, offers the gift of gradual transformation. Twelve years later, I am a different person because of that one moment on that one day in August of 2008 and because of the 4,384 days since then. I pray that I am wiser. That I am more faithful. That my heart and mind have been broadened by offering them to another. So it is with the journey of faith. For people and for churches, we change. Sometimes all at once, sometimes with gradual awareness. After reflecting on her own conversion story, writer Anne Lamott writes, I do not at all understand the mystery of grace, only that it meets us where we are, but does not leave us where it found us. May it be so for you, for our church, for this whole beautiful and broken world. Amen.